Well, everyone, it is 12.03 and that's Lindley's time to start. Um, good afternoon, welcome to this week's edition of Much and Learn. And there's a few pieces of housekeeping before we introduce our speaker. We are recording. And if you're wondering why, it's because this will be published on the Dixon's YouTube page. So if you've ever missed a week or just want to revisit a talk, you can always find it there. And since we're recording, we do ask that you stay on mute. If you, for some reason, accidentally unmute, please don't be offended if we mute you for yourself. I'm your host this week, Sarah Lorenz. I'm the special events manager at the Dixon. And today we're gonna to learn about the biodiversity of the Hatchie River, which is the longest unchannelized tributary of the Mississippi and contains the largest forested floodplain in Tennessee. Our speaker is also going to discuss the Hatchie Bird Fest. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to place them in the chat. And when Sonia is finished, we'll get to those. Now, I would like to introduce Sonia Outlaw Clark. Sonia grew up and still lives on her family's Century Farm in the heart of the Tennessee Delta region, just outside of Brownsville. After a career in graphic design at a local newspaper and many years of event planning and volunteer work, Sonia took the helm at the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in 2010. Since that time, she's worked to preserve and promote the rich heritage of the region through the center's three main focuses, music, natural resources, and agricultural history. Sonia also serves as the lead tourism person for Brownsville and Haywood County, and has earned certificates as a travel marketing professional, certified Tennessee tourism professional, and certified festival and event planner. Sonia will be showing us a video at the end of her talk today, and we ask that you please adjust the sound as you need to. It's possible that the volume might be a little faint for some. So Sonia, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's an honor to be on here with all you folks and hope that I can share some information with you that maybe you didn't know, but hopefully you've all been to the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center and maybe this will be a little bit of a old hat for you, but still that you might hear something you didn't, didn't know or find out when you visited. So I'm going to share my screen if y'all uh, bear with me for a minute. Okay, so that didn't go back where I needed it to. So let me see if I can get back to the first. Don't you love technical difficulties? There we go. All right, everybody can see me or see the screen, right? Yes. So as Sarah said, I am the director at the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center. I have been here since 2010. It's been an adventure. It's been rewarding. Uh, we, the center it is, has actually been open since 1998, uh, started out as a tourist, des tourist um, information center, and we have um, been migrating to and have finally reached a uh, music heritage destination with all of our, um, our two buildings on site and some of the things that we offer inside. So I'm going to give you all a quick overview of uh, basically what all is encompassed in the center. So this is our, our three buildings. This is our main building. Uh, that was originally a Western Sizzlin Steakhouse. It was uh, renovated, refurbished to be the Delta Heritage Center by our former mayor in 1998. And that, so that was our first building. Then we moved this little small house right over here, which is the last home of bluesman Sleepy John Estes. And then most recently we moved this building right here, which is Flag Grove School. 
and we moved it from Nutbush, and I'll tell you more about that as we go. So Flag Grove School is a one-room school that was located in Nutbush, Tennessee, and just happened to be the school that Tina Turner attended, grades one through eight. Uh, if you didn't know, we are the hometown of Tina Turner. Most people around here knew her as Anna Mae Bullock, which is her real name. Tina is a stage name. The school had been closed since 1967, was fixing to be uh, demolished to make room for an irrigation system in a field. So we were happy to be able to save it and preserve it and to kind of showcase Tina to the world since she came from right here. Kind of let people know what kind of humble beginnings she had. So as you go in, you see the glitz and the glamour of Tina Turner and who she's become, the queen of rock and roll. That's a view as you walk in the door. You see her costumes, we have gold records. All of this came from her. But then you also have the history and the legacy of the educational component of the old school. When we saved the building, it had been used for a barn for a number of years and there were actual desks and benches and the chalkboards were still on the wall. The cubbies were still on the wall. Uh, so all of that had been preserved over in a corner with straw thrown on top of it. When we restored the school, we, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about that, y'all. Um, when we restored the school, we were actually able to save the original floors, walls, and the ceiling. Where there were boards missing in the ceiling and the walls, there was another school nearby uh, built at the same time, which was 1889. And it was that school was beyond repair, but there was still enough material there that we could salvage to save and replace the boards. Uh, that we were missing. The floor, for some reason, and we don't know why, was a double hardwood floor. So it was a hardwood floor on top of a hardwood floor. So where the floor was messed up, we were able to use boards that were underneath that were in perfect, <clears throat> perfect condition and then replace them on top. So we, we got really lucky there with some of the material to restore the building. Sleepy John Estes, we talked about his small home moved here in the um, late 90s. It's a two room shotgun house and was the last home that he lived in. He passed away in 1977. If you're not sure who uh, John Estes is, a lot of people don't recognize his name, but you'll probably know his music. He was a pretty prolific songwriter. He wrote about the community. He wrote about um, his travels. He wrote about people that he knew. And one, a few of his songs, if you've heard Bob Dylan do Someday Baby Blues, that was a Sleepy John song. Greg Allman's Floating Bridge, is a Sleepy John song. And most recently, Keb Moe and Taj Mahal have done a remake of Diving Duck Blues. That was also a Sleepy John song. So a lot of people know his music. They just don't realize Sleepy John was who wrote all that and who performed. But he was a pioneer in the early 1900s when the blues genre was just starting to come about and become popular music. So to our main building, the first building that was originally the Western Sizzling Steakhouse, this is our lobby. When you walk in, we've got this great fireplace that's uh, especially good in the winter time because you can sit down by the fire and, and warm up and um, talk a little bit and learn a little bit of our history. Before COVID, you see over here in the corner, there's a drum kit. That's our picking corner. 
before COVID, if you were a musician, you could come in. If you played drums, we had guitars, uh, tambourines, just different things that you could come in and play. Um, hopefully soon, we will be able to do that again because one of the special things about being here is you never knew when you were going to come in and find musicians playing and impromptu concerts happening. This is our cotton museum. Haywood County is the largest cotton producing county in the state of Tennessee, uh, still our number one industry here. And so we wanted to be able to showcase that agriculture history. We've got stations that show you about grading cotton and how it's classed. Uh, you can actually touch cotton. A lot of people come through here who have never uh, seen cotton. Uh, so they're able to touch it and they're able to feel it. They can get an idea of what it was like to have to hand pick cotton when they grab hold of the bowls and get stuck, their hands get stuck. We have primitive implements um, that would have been horse drawn. We've got fertilizer spreaders, planters, plows, shovels, things like that in the room. And the showcase of the room is our gin display. This is a 1 16th scale replica of an actual cotton gin. This really allows us to showcase to our visitors the ginning process and explain the process that cotton goes through to get from the field uh, to the mills. And we, we usually see on average during a normal year, we see 30,000 plus visitors from all over the world here. So there are a number of people who come through that this is their first experience with cotton. And this gin is one from the 1960s, early 70s, of course, the process. Uh, the ginning process is the same, but the uh, getting the cotton to the gin and the um, form that it's in when it gets to the gin now is different. This is the back view of that display and you see an actual cotton field. You see the um, modern cotton pickers and things that you would use to the mechanized way of farming. And this is our music museum. We have the West Tennessee Music Museum and we showcase a lot of the uh, popular musicians that were from this area. Of course, Carl Perkins from Jackson, Tennessee. We've got Elvis over in the corner. Um, that's on items on loan from Graceland. Uh, Eddie Arnold, the Tennessee Plowboy is depicted here. We also have a lot of the Sax people. The mural on the wall back here are our three Brownsville bluesmen. Looking at your screen, Sleepy John is on the right, and that's whose home I showed you earlier. Uh, the fella in the middle is Yank Rachel. He was a mandolin player. And the guy on the left is Hammy Nixon. He was a harmonica player. These three traveled together most of their lives. And um, Sleepy John was blind, so they were really, they were companions, they were friends, uh, and they were lots of help to him uh, in his travels and stuff because they were people he could trust. There's our Elvis, Denise, Denise LaSalle, and the yellow outfit is Jazzy A, who is a dancer and choreographer. She is also a radio personality, but she was the old hen in the Bobby Rush show for anyone who's seen a Bobby Rush blues show uh, and remember the song they do about the old hen. She was the dancer for that act. Just a few more pictures from our music room. So this is our Hatchie River Museum. So as Sarah said earlier, the significant thing about the Hatchie River is it's the last wild river in the lower Mississippi system. And by wild, we mean that it's never been altered by man. It's never been dredged. It's never been channelized. It's 
uh, ecosystem, its floodplain, all of that is still intact. So in the museum, we showcase fish that are native to it. You see the um, aquariums to the left there. The large pictures are of the hatchy uh, by a local photographer. There's a catfish. This is an alligator snapping turtle. Uh, it was an actual turtle that has been taxidermied uh, that helps us to show the size. They get up to 240 pounds. They are actually beginning to be endangered. Uh, so that, that gives us an opportunity to really talk about conservation and all the efforts and all of the natural elements that are still pretty prevalent in the Hatchie River region. This is the Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's just two miles from us and there's lots of educational opportunities there as well as outdoor activity. Uh, as you walk around the lake there are now interpretive panels around that tell you about the different um, waterfowl, uh, these particular ones are ducks that are found on the refuge. The refuge is a waterfowl refuge. Its primary purpose is the uh, preservation and the um, feeding and giving opportunity for waterfowl to, to land there. It's on the Mississippi Flyway, so there's the birds and fowl that are coming through are constantly changing. That's our wildlife office. And that's another view of O'Neill Lake. O'Neill Lake is a man-made lake on the refuge. It's the only man-made lake there. Most of the other lakes are oxbows as the river because it's not been changed. It, you know, it kind of creates its own path still. But O'Neill Lake, is man-made and it was the first location for Project Fish. And if you notice the uh, fishing piers along here do not have rails on the outside, on the water side. And that is so that it can be totally handicap accessible. Uh, there are other piers around that are accessible as well. So Project Fish was an opportunity to give uh, those with disabilities an opportunity to enjoy fishing and like the rest of us. So that's something that was um, very unique about when this lake was being built that these piers were going to be different and going to offer that opportunity. Something that we focus on about the refuge is bird watching. Bird watching is a year round thing because we are in the Mississippi Flyway, there are, as the seasons change, the birds change on the refuge. We have the birds that are here year round, but then we have the ones who are coming through at different times of the year migrating. So to celebrate that and to kind of promote that um, sport, I guess you would call it, and to um, help educate people on conservation efforts and ways that they can um, be more eco-friendly or eco-aware uh, is our annual Hatchie Bird Fest. We hold it on the last week of April every year. Last year, of course, we went totally virtual. This year, it's going to be kind of a hybrid event. And I want to just kind of show you a little bit of what we have to offer. So it's April the 23rd and 25th. And we don't just kind of turn you loose out on, out on the refuge. We have like expert birders. Uh, we have Bob Ford, who, of course, is very involved in the effort, but we also have members from the Memphis Ornithological Society, the Memphis chapter, and uh, they also come out and they help us lead bird hikes and help with our educational components on that weekend. 
So a lot of people think of bird watching and when, and especially when we say we're going to go out on the refuge and do hikes and things like that, they think like maybe they're not qualified, they don't know enough about birds, or they're not able to walk long distances or over difficult terrain. But our festival is a little different in that respect. We're for all ages. We encourage all ages. Uh, we obviously encourage children to come be a part of it and for parents and grandparents to share that with their children. Uh, everything that we do is um, not above anyone's head. It can be, it, it's something that can be broken down to every level. Uh, we want people to realize that you don't have to just, you know, be out on the refuge or in these special spots to bird watch. That's something you can do from your backyard or your front yard or just wherever you're at, you can, you can bird watch. This is a great blue heron down on the refuge. You, you know, you, you see those around a lot of places, even driving by and you have places where there's water, you'll see them standing out in it. And of course, we talked about the refuge being a waterfowl sanctuary. And of course, for migratory birds, but sometimes they decide to hang around and have a family too. This is one of our bird watching groups out there walking around O'Neill Lake. You can see that the um, packed gravel there is pretty easy to, to maneuver on and to walk on. You have, you have the birds who are over on the lake side, then you can see birds that are along the tree line. So you've got multiple views of where you can spot the different species. Uh, what you don't see is that back here where the camera is at, there's a line of cars. On a normal basis, we would uh, put everybody on a bus and take you out. You would get on and off the bus so you're not walking like for a mile into the woods or anything like that. Um, this particular, this was year before last and we started caravanning and carpooling. Uh, which will probably be the case from now on uh, since uh, COVID. But so even for people, some of these people walk the whole way. There's a two mile walk around O'Neill Lake. So just for people who want to maybe get out of the city and come out and just walk around and enjoy the view, you've got a nice two mile track around that. But for those who maybe can't walk long distances or can't stand for long periods of time, uh, it's perfect to take your vehicle. You can get out when they spot something and everyone stops and starts looking. You can jump out and you can check that out. And if you need to go step back down or you don't have to walk, you can drive around. This is out in the field in one of the open fields there. Again, they're on a trail that's really easy. You can see that it's easy to social distance when you're bird watching. Um, Bob Ford is out there with this group. That's Bob right there, if you can see my cursor. Uh, he's leading this group and he's talking with everyone. Last year, he did this virtually. Uh, he went out in the field um, by himself with a camera. Uh, he did take his daughter on a couple of them, but they uh, went out and talked about what they were seeing. And so it was, it was nice for those of us who never get to go out in the field. I'm always uh, here at the center trying to keep things organized and going here. So it was really nice for me that that was done virtually and I got to experience some of what the others experienced. We have educational seminars uh, on Saturdays. This is a lot of what's happening during the day is different seminars and educational opportunities. This particular class was a beginner bird watcher class. And uh, this guy's with the Tennessee State Parks. We have a great partnership with the Tennessee State Parks, with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, with the federal 
uh, wildlife surfaces so that we are able to um, have all those experts here to help us out. This is Sarah Levy. Um, she and her husband, David, own Willa Oaks Farms, which is a nursery that is here in Brownsville. And on Sundays of our bird fest, everyone goes out there and they open their greenhouses and allow everyone to walk around, look around. And then the classes are held there on their ground. So you're outside, you're enjoying the outdoors, you're enjoying all the flowers. Uh, it's really nicely landscaped around there. And that's Sarah talking about pollinator plants and how important they are to the ecosystem. There's usually gardening classes on how to create habitat, bird habitat, and even wildlife habitat uh, in your own yards, regardless of what size they are. It's another photo from the back of the class. And this year, our educational components on Sunday, we're still going to be out at Willow Oaks Farm. During Saturday, they are going to be virtual classes. On Sunday, we'll probably also be kind of both. Um, we'll probably, the in-person classes, hopefully we'll be able to go live on Facebook and let people join that way as well. Another big highlight of the weekend is our Birds of Prey program. This is through the uh, Real Foot State Parks. Uh, if you've been to the Real Foot and been there to the State Park, to the Welcome Center and stuff, you've probably seen the uh, birds that they are trying to rehabilitate. Uh, when birds are injured from an eagle to whatever, Sometimes they are able to take them, rehabilitate them, and return them to the wild. Sometimes the um, creatures are not able to be returned to the wild. They're saved and they're healthy, but there may be like a wing that's clipped or something and they're not able to fly or, or able to uh, protect themselves or do what they need to if they were in the wild. And those animals are used in an education program to teach about birds and um, their habits, their lifestyle, um, what their different features are used for. And so this is a really popular program. It's a great way to get up close to the birds. There are usually eagles, um, hawks, and owls, some and different species of each. And some of them, even some of the owls in the past, you've been able to actually touch. Uh, the eagles you've not been able to touch. Um, don't know that I've ever touched any of the hawks, but we have had some of the owls that have been, um, I don't know that tame is the right word, but gentle enough that they would allow someone to touch them. So the kids love that. There's a hawk. And this program is held outside of our center under our pavilion. So Friday night is always a big night for us for um, Hatchy Bird Fest because that's an opportunity for us to have special speakers come in. And this year, because we're virtual and last year as well, um, this year our special guest is going to be Richard Crossley. He is an internationally acclaimed birder. He's a photographer and of course an award-winning author. The Crossley ID guides for different, is like a series of different bird guides. He's originally from Yorkshire, England, but has lived in the US for the last 30 years. And he has a new project that he's going to introduce to us, a new book. Uh, he's, he uh, settled in Cape May, New Jersey, but he spends a lot of his time between Florida and California because of the different types of birds that he's interested in. So he and uh, co-author Holly Marker have a new book called Ornotherapy. Ornotherapy for your mind, body, and soul. 
Holly's background was in art therapy, but she's also been a professional bird guide for the National Audubon, the American Birding Association, and some others. But ornotherapy seemed kind of appropriate for this year, uh, especially after we've gone through 2020 and things are starting to open up again and uh, people are starting to get out more. Uh, it's watching birds, not only for fun, but for, for good for you. Uh, it's the mindful observation of birds and how they benefit our mind, body, and soul. So his presentation on Friday night, it, like I said, it will be virtual and there will be a link up soon on our website, hatchybirdfest.com. So anyone can uh, register for that. It will be a Zoom presentation. So you, they say, and I'm not read the bet, but I'm really interested in it because it sounds so fun. The book teaches that if we allow birds and nature to slow us down, we are self-medicating. Through observation, we learn not only about birds, but gain insight into our own lives and connect to the world around us. I just think that sounds calming and fun and um, can't wait to hear their presentation and, and all the benefits that we probably don't realize are there or that we're getting sometimes. So that's a little bit about our Hatchy Bird Fest. So we hope that you will connect with us either in person or online. The complete schedule will be up, I hope, by Friday on our festival website. If you go there and look right now, I was hoping it would be up by today, but the site is not actually up. We were in the process of changing it and making some additions to it and the schedule kind of got pushed behind. So I'm sorry that that's not up for y'all today and that you can't just go there right now and, and look at that. But by Friday is my goal that all of that will be there. So hopefully just keep checking back and, and see what all is going to be there. And there will be a link there for you to uh, sign up for the ornotherapy session. So now we've, I've got a short video. Uh, it is actually a virtual trip down the Hatchie River uh, and it's led by F Bob Ford and you'll hear him talking. Uh, if you know Bob Ford, you know he has kind of a real calm voice. So you may need to turn your volume up a little bit when we start it, but he has a wealth of information to share with you about the Hatchie River. And this is from last year's uh, Hatchie Bird Fest when he uh, recorded this for our virtual festival. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Today we're on the Hatchie River on Earth Day 2020. Hatchie River is a special resource, a national treasure really right here in northern Mississippi and West Mississippi. Hatchie is nearly 240 miles long, river miles. Starts in northern Mississippi, flows north into Tennessee, slowly starts to curve northwest and around the central part of West Tennessee. It turns west and and all this water goes straight into the Mississippi River, Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. This river is a, is a swamp river, at least that's what I call it. Slow moving, meandering, very broad floodplain. Carries a lot of water during some times of the year. <coughs> less water in the Mississippi Important ecological aspect about this river is that the river is not just what you see in front of you, not just the main stem, but the river itself, a lot of ecologists, including myself, would include the bottomland hardwood forest and the floodplain because flooding is a natural part of this system, an important part of this system. It regenerates wetlands, water quality, provides rich soil for forests, 
wildlife. This river itself is, is much broader than what you see here. Some places the river floodplain forest can be a mile wide on the Hatchie. Hatchie was designated a state scenic river in 1970. In Tennessee, it's the only river designated as scenic that is included uh, in its entirety. Lots of beautiful rivers in Tennessee. Water is one of our greatest natural resources in this wonderful state. But for Hatchie, it's important to think about the scenic value the values of this river in its whole. The system from top to bottom, side to side, all the pieces make up one long, beautiful, important ecosystem that functions well. The watershed of the Hatchie is nearly 1.6 million acres. Watershed support land uses of forestry and agriculture primarily. The value of the soil and the trees is often uh, in many places related to this river. The actual the natural flooding that's happened has helped enrich the soils over over years, and that rich soil adds to the uh, tremendous growth potential for both trees and agricultural crops. In this 1.6 million acres of watershed along the Hatchie River itself, there's estimated to be nearly 150,000 acres of bottomland hardwood forest. And if you think about the forest as actually part of the river itself, the subtleties in the how the, how the forest itself is balanced out across the floodplain is pretty remarkable. Water and elevation dictate. Look across the floodplain and it looks very flat, but actually it's not. Six inches of elevation difference can mean the difference between an entire tree species community. The wetter spots have cypress and water tupid oak. It's a little bit drier and might get over cup oak. A little bit drier than that. Swamp chestnut oak, cherry bark oak, and a host of others. So there are natural systems here within the system. Natural communities that are driven both by elevation and this natural flood regime. Very, very important. One river this, one reason this river was designated as a state scenic river, the last remaining tributary to the lower Mississippi River that has not been channelized. Channelization was a process of straightening out these meanders in order to have flood control. That is to get the water off the land as quickly as possible with a straight line ditch. The Hatchie in its entirety is not been channelized and thus remains a natural scenic river, a natural river with its meanders and its flood regime and the creation of oxbow lakes and cutoff lakes in the forest. The system itself has over a hundred different species of fish, incredibly rich diversity. The Hatchie can count 11 species of catfish, ranging from the ones that we know really well, like flathead catfish, one of the largest fish in the Hatchie system, to some of the small darters that we may not consider catfish if you look at it, uh, but they are, they're in the catfish family, small fish, three inches long or so. Uh, very important to the system here. Hatchie also has 35 different species of mussels, the small clams, a lot of people call them, that, uh, that occur in sand banks and mud banks along the river. 
underwater, live their lives underwater. An important part of the system here. Very important to how the system works. Over the course of a year, the Hatchie bottomland hardwood here might have over 250 species of birds visited. There are summer residents, there are winter residents, there are birds that come through only in migration in the spring and the fall. It may be well known to a lot of people for numbers of waterfowl in the winter, mallard primarily, or can get up to 100,000 or more ducks. This time of year, however, it's known well for the thousands of birds passing through in migration from points south in the tropics. South America, Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean. Those birds travel through here. Some birds stop here to nest every spring and then return to the tropics in the fall. Hatchie is not just a natural resource. The watershed itself has helped create a strong and rich cultural heritage. From the headwaters where Ida B. Wells was born and raised in Holly Springs, Mississippi to, to the middle part of the Hatchie watershed where Carl Perkins, Tina Turner, Sleepy John Estes, Sonny Boy Williamson, all rich cultural music through the end of the river, the mouth of the river, which was the home of Isaac Hayes and Alex Haley. Watershed has generated both natural and strong cultural resources. couple of species unique to the Hatchie. One uh, has just been recently discovered to science, the Hatchie burrowing crayfish, a small crawdad that's endemic to West Tennessee, occurs only in this spot. There are a couple of other species that are in peril that we watch out for in particular along the riverbanks, including some of those small fish and mussels. Within the 130,000 acres of bottomland hardwood forest and, and more acreage of floodplain habitats, the Hatchie is home to two national wildlife refuges that occupy nearly 25,000 acres of habitat for fish and wildlife populations. One is in the middle part of the Hatchie, the Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge. The other is at the mouth, the Lower Hatchie National Wildlife Refuge. Access to the river is, <laughs> is good, is good. There's not too much, but there's enough. Uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency has several boat ramps along the river for easy access and public enjoyment of this national treasure. Maintaining the integrity of the Hatchie watershed and the Hatchie River system is of utmost importance. It's the last remaining type of its kind of fully unchannelized tributary to the Mississippi River. Bottomland hardwoods that are rich and have a natural flood regime, home to countless number of birds over the course of the year. The river system itself, this main stem, the channel has fish and mussel. The system holds still many, many secrets. Dragonflies, damselflies, caddisflies, all kinds of aquatic insects occur here that 
we just simply don't yet know about. I encourage you to get out and explore the hatchie. Be kind to it. Be gentle with it. Enjoy it. And share those stories with your friends and family about the importance of this unique resource. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed uh, Bob's trip down the hatchie. It's always um, relaxing and calming to, to be on the hatchie river and to experience that. Uh, thank you for having me here today and letting me talk to you a little bit about the Delta Heritage Center, about our hatchie bird fest. And I appreciate y'all hanging in there with me. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. Um, we have some questions for you, and I think we all are grateful for knowing, for learning something that just our neighbor north of us, we didn't probably know existed, um, which was the Heritage Center and the Bird Festival. I did not know about it. A um, couple of questions. Does it cost anything to participate in the Bird Festival? It does not. It does not. There is no charge. There have been little things here and there, like when we've done a, um, the Park Service did a beginner birding, birding course uh, one year, and there was a charge for that, but it covered the cost of a uh, guidebook. So it was just like $10 a person. Okay. How do you, how are you funded? Um, actually, the Delta Heritage Center will uh, covers most of the costs for the bird fest. The rest is in kind through all those agencies like the state parks and fish and wildlife. Uh, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation also helps us financially to present it. Okay, thanks. About, this is a two part question, about how many people in a non-pandemic year would you expect to see at the bird festival and how many, well, let's go with that first. Okay, I was gonna say, don't give me too many at once. <laughs> um, our best year, we had roughly 200 here at one time. Okay. Uh, they, the people kind of change through the, the days. Some people will be here on Saturday, others will be here on Sunday. So a lot of people don't come every day, they'll pick and choose what they wanna do. Okay. But overall, about 200 people. Thank you. My second part of that was, do you measure the number of visitors you have at the Heritage Center in any given month or any given year? And what are the drivers for attendance? Are there certain times of the year, like the Bird Festival, when other people come? So in the pre-pandemic, we were seeing 30 to 32,000 people a year. Uh, that would vary by month uh, according to the weather. Obviously, winter months are slower than summer months. Our biggest times are usually around Bird Fest and around Hatchy um, Exit 56 Blues Fest, which is the end of May. So during that spring travel period, uh, and those festival weekends. For our Exit 56 Blues Fest, uh, pre-pandemic, we saw four or 5,000 people over a weekend. Wow. Uh, fall is a really busy time as well. I, I don't know how it will be moving forward, but our international travelers travel more in the spring and the fall, uh, especially because most of those are senior adults or um, are, are not traveling when the families are out with their kids and stuff. Our driver is our music heritage. People are coming, they're looking for Tina Turner. They're, you know, worldwide Tina Turner fans. Uh, but once they get here for that, they, they spend hours just looking at the rural um, culture of the area through the other museum. And a lot go down to the Hatchie and we'll do some hikes or just to Get to spend some time outdoors. Okay. Um, since you mentioned Tina Turner, 
I'm going to go out of order with some of the questions that have been sent in. We have had a request for some, actually not by me. I, I told Sonia earlier that we were going to talk about Tina Turner, but somebody else actually asked for some fun facts or any information. Does Tina Turner ever come, for example? Has she been there before? Okay, so she has not been at the center. Uh, she's been involved in the project very heavily um, with photos and videos and emails. She keeps up with everything that's going on. She was scheduled to be here for the opening of Flag Grove School, and that was when she started having all her health issues. And, uh, you know, that that's kind of been highlighted a lot in the uh, media lately because she had a new documentary that just came out this past weekend but she does have some health issues and she's not as easily able to travel um, she used to come in and out of Brownsville a lot when she had close relatives here she, you would not know she was here uh, but she she does not have any close relatives here anymore so really no reason to visit other than just to to come see us. Okay. Um, the right way to say that is she hasn't been there yet because we hope that she will. <laughs> True. Um, there's two more questions. Yeah. I, keep say, I keep saying that. Um, two more questions. Paul has asked, do you post any videos to YouTube? Yes, we have a YouTube channel. It's Delta Heritage Center. And there are several categories there. There are uh, music. There's We have an exhibition exchange that we do monthly uh, about different exhibits and stuff. There's a curator's corner there featuring different items in our collection. So there's quite a bit of stuff on our YouTube channel. That's good information. Um, Suzanne has left a comment and Wants, us to, wants you to know what an amazing journey that video was and how fortunate we were to be able to see the river and the watershed. And it feels that the Hatchie River is a fine example of what a waterway should look like. Um, before I ask the last question, the Dixon has tried to institute bird watching. So Sonia, I'm not sure if you're familiar with where we're located, but our friend Kim Rucker, who is on the call here, she is our, one of our gardening um, gurus at the Dixon, has told me that we only have city birds. So bird watching at the Dixon isn't a big draw, but Margarita has a question for you, Sonia. Are you a bird watcher? And if so, what bird is your favorite? Um, I'm not a bird watcher. I guess I'm a backyard birder. Um, Gosh, my favorite. You know, I think my favorite is the barn swallow, which is one of those common everyday birds. Um, I get people that fuss at me all the time because I let them build their nest every year under my porch. But, you know, I just, I love their coloring. I, I love that they're darting in and out of there all the time and that I get to get to see them. You know, I love to watch them like when they're raising their babies. And so I'm the barn swallow. Thank you for answering that. I think I'm the same type of bird watcher, like in my yard. And I have to tell you that lately, my favorite is just the common grackle. Man, those guys are all over the place. They're just doing so many things and intimidating so many others. It's just fascinating to watch the interaction between different species. Oh, yeah. That's really cool, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. May I ask a question of Sonia, please? Yes, yes. Hey, hey, Sonia, I enjoyed everything that you showed us and talked about today. But also, I'm a big fan of Tina Turner, and I can't help but ask one more question about her. Is there any way, if she, her health is not, you know, too bad, can she do a Zoom with y'all and we can, you know, all see it? Tina is not um, very tech savvy, is her, what, as she puts it. Um, 
I'll help her. I have not I have not gotten her to agree to anything like that yet. She has done a couple of videos for us and we show those in the school. Um, we show one of them where she talks about what she remembers of Nutbush and going to Flag Grove School. So that's available in the school for people to come and sit down and just watch her talking about what she remembers. Okay, thank you so much. You know, you know, Tina. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chip in. I'm from St. Louis. My favorite bird is the cardinal. <laughs> My I, almost, I almost said that because I've had so many of those in my yard lately, but then I thought, no, you know, I still like that barn swallow. Well, thank you very much for being here, Sonia. Um, does anybody have any other questions before we talk just briefly about what next week is going to look like and then sign off? All right. Well, next week, um, Dale Skaggs will be delivering part two of the flowers and plants we can look forward to at our plant sale. And if you are not a Dixon member, we encourage you to join, become part of the family and help us continue. Look at this. Okay. Help us to do good programming like this. Um, but that should conclude it for this evening or for today. So we'll hope to see you next week. Thank you very much, Sonia. Hey, Sarah, I need to tell all the other people something. Kevin was on Channel 5 a few minutes ago on talking about the exhibit there, the Joy Fest, and also about the tulips and all that stuff. Kevin, well, that's exciting. Thank you for telling us, Joanne. So maybe they can look at it at 5 o'clock and maybe they'll be back on again or either 10. Or we can go to their website. Maybe at some point they'll put a link up. I'll see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Hi, everybody. Bye, Sarah. Thank you, Sonia. See you guys next week. Thank you.